And yet another very excellent evening. Got that, all of you, my dearest of friends. We left off in our Bible study on the completion of the book of Nehemiah, which, ironically, the book of Nehemiah is the last recorded annals of Old Testament history regarding the people of God in the Old Testament. But now we're going to be coming back to what others say is the most ancient book of the Bible. The book of Job. Fascinating read this one is. Pay very close attention, my friends. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. We are told that Job was born in the land of Uz. Right up here you'll see Israel. Right down here you'll see Edom. From the mention, according to Charles Ellicott, from the mention of the land of Uz in Lamentation 4.21, and the kings of the land of Uz in Jeremiah 25.20, where in each case the association seems to be with Edom, whose name was Job. The name is really Eov. And is carefully to be distinguished from the Yov, who was the son of Issachar in Genesis 46, 13. And from the Jobab or Yovab, who was one of the kings of Edom. That's the one that I reference right here. I do believe that it's the same man, but I could not be. I don't know. Now, what about the time in which Job lived? Eusebius fixes it about the time of Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, about the time of Isaac, 1,800 years before Christ and 600 after the flood of Noah. Agreeing with this are the following considerations. Number one, Job's length of life is patriarchal. He lives a long time, so this sets him back there with those ancients. 200 years. He alludes only to the earliest form of idolatry, namely the worship of the sun, moon, and heavenly host. There is no allusion to the exodus from Egypt and to the miracles that accompanied it, because it's believed they didn't happen yet, nor to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, though there is to the flood, Job 22. And these events happening in Job's vicinity would have been striking illustrations of the argument for God's interposition and destroying the wicked and vindicating the righteous, meaning that if Job had knowledge of these other events, surely they would have been brought up because they were perfect examples and which could be alluded to for his particular circumstances. Nor is there any undoubted reference to the Jewish law. Some believe that there are, but to the Jewish law, ritual, and priesthood. The religion of Job is that which prevailed among the patriarchs previous to the law. Sacrifices performed by the head of the family, like Job, the fathers. Not official priests, no officiating priesthood, temple, or consecrated altar. In either case, the author, date, and place of the book of Job are all uncertain and up for debate. It may be that Job himself recorded his experiences in the book. Job wrote it. Or there may well have been another anonymous author. Judging by the style of the Hebrew it uses, some scholars judge Job to be the oldest book of the Old Testament. The book of Job is not primarily about one man's suffering and pain. Don't just see it as a man being tried. There's a lot more going on right here. Job's problem is not so much financial or social or medical. His central problem is theological. Job must deal with the fact that in his life, God does not act the way he always thought God would and should act. It is a true and real history that we here have of this man Job and not a fiction or a moral parable as some have believed. See a double testimony for this, the legitimacy of Job and that it is mentioned in Ezekiel by the Lord himself. This man, Job, is mentioned in Ezekiel 14 by God himself. The other apostolical in that James makes mention of Job in the New Testament. So we have Old Testament verification and New Testament verification. This is a real being. And such a well-twined cord is not easily broken. Now, having set all of that groundwork for us, Let's get into this book of Job. We're told about how Job, a perfect man, upright in the land of Uz, he has seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east, the greatest among them. Even the kings would come to Job. This man is great. 
and his sons went and feasted in their houses. Everyone his day, believed to be his birthday, and sent and called for their three daughters to eat and to drink with them. We do not see a mention among his seven sons and three daughters anything about wives, nothing about husbands. These are young, probably not much older than being in their mid-twenties or so. And here we see them partying, living it up, as many youth do. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings, according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Let us not skim over this, my friends. Job, he is concerned about them while they're partying. Now, Job, as we know later on through his con uh, conversing with his other friends, we know he's not an idiot. And he knows the youthful vices that can be partook. So there's a concern with Job, and it's a major concern. And that is that they are sinning while they're partying, and that they may be cursing God in their hearts, not outwardly cursing God, but turning from God in their hearts in order for the ways of the world. That is very important to keep in mind. The reason why I'm harping on this is because this is going to get brought up a little bit later. And oh, the tragedy and the sadness and the absolute grief, over, the overcoming grief would just be unbearable. And we see that it almost is for Job. Let this be a lesson for any and all parents. You can still pray no matter how far that they are away from you. You can still pray for them and uh, that God would watch over them. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So all the angels, seemingly even the good and the bad, or perhaps Satan is the representative of the fallen ones. Now, we don't know. We're not told enough about it. But they're all there, and Satan is brought forth before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. What is suggested here is the swiftness and ubiquity of his survey of men. The growing light of revelation casts the figure of Satan into deeper shade, and his restless activity receives a corresponding deepness of tint in the New Testament with Simon Peter, your adversary, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And Satan's response is one well worth noting because he doesn't say, Job, who's Job? No, he has watched Job. He has observed him very clearly, and one can very confidently gather that because of his response. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for not what he loves you for nothing? Do you think it's for nothing that he serves you? A subtle turn is given to the words of Satan by Godet in his essay on Job, who thinks that while they are openly a slur upon man, his words are covertly a sarcasm on the Most High himself, implying that no one truly loves him. He is served only for the benefits he confers. If Godet's analysis be correct, then an even greater light is shed upon the words of Christ when he tells his followers to deny themselves, to take up their cross, to even give their own lives, while all throughout loving God above all the suffering and pleasures alike. Love God above everything else. And we see this played out in the days of Job. So once again, Satan, he argues that Job only loves God because he's given him all these gifts. Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. 
And Pulpit made a comment right here at the end. Satan did not delay, but promptly departed to take advantage of the permission given to him. To be in the presence of God must be an intense pain to the evil one. He didn't linger. The second he was allowed to leave, he left. You and I seek the presence of God. Satan wants to get away. And this Old Testament narrative is an actual display of that in which Paul the Apostle wrote unto the Ephesians in the New. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 13. And there was a day. We're not told about how, how much longer later. We just know that Satan's plan is now being put in play. And all of this, remember, all of this is going to happen in one night in a huge storm is going to come up. Probably the, one of the most terrifying storms one could ever picture in their mind. But it takes, I don't know, a, a week or so for a huge storm like this to be conjured up. So it probably took two or three weeks. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside themselves. And the Sabians, the Arabians, fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So now we see the hedge brought down, this storm conjured up, and the very first tactic of Satan really is to rile up his own children, these evil people against the servants of God. And we see these Sabians come in and they take away the oxen, the asses, and they kill some of Job's servants. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God, pay attention to this, the fire of God is fallen from heaven. And hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. This is going to come up later. They're attributing these calamities to that of God. Not knowing the heavenly counsel that just took place. It's actually Satan. But this would set in the mind of Job that God is coming against him. Whenever in all actuality it's Satan. So first the Sabians come in. Take away his oxen, his asses. Kill his servants, some of them. And next, this lightning, it's very much assumed to be lightning, but not only lightning, probably hailstones as well, this huge hailstorm, because this is a massive storm, and hell follows such storms. And all of his sheep perish, as well as those servants watching over them. And the next verse continues these calamities. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands, and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped to tell thee. And this is all just truly dreadful, and the haste of which it's happening, I mean, for a, one of these to happen over a year's time is just absolutely crushing, but for all to happen in one night, and not only this, this is implanting in Job's mind that both God and man are now turning on him. So now all of Job's substance, all of his money, all of his livestock, all of that gone, even many of innocent servants are dead, and which shows you that if you're in the vicinity of someone in whom Satan is attacking, and this happens a lot, if you'll see tsunamis, tornadoes, you'll hear about little babies dying in the midst of them. If you're in that vicinity, innocents die during this time. And now we see this. While he was yet speaking... There came also another, and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house, men get crushed in the roof. And it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And all the commentators agree this was a giant tornado. The tornado came the more violently over the desert, being uninterrupted, conjured by Satan himself, no less. And there's a whole lot more worse than what you and I are imagining happening right here. 
upon his sons and their youth and his daughters also, as appears from the sequel in the next verse. This was the greatest of all Job's losses, without a doubt, his ten children being undoubtedly by far the dearest and most valuable of his possessions, and it could not but go nearest to him, and therefore Satan reserved it to the last. That if the other provocations failed, this might make him curse God, the loss of his children. Satan, he, his entire objective is to make you and I curse God just as he did. Because he doesn't believe that anyone truly loves God. Our children are part of ourselves, and it touches a good man and a most tender part to be deprived of any of them. One would be devastating, but all ten in one night along with all your livestock and your money, and it gets worse. What then must Job have felt when he learned that he had lost his whole ten at once, and that in one moment he was written childless? It was also an aggravation of the calamity that they had been taken away so suddenly, without any previous warning. Had they died by some lingering disease, and he had had notice to expect their death? And prepare for the breach, the affliction would have been more tolerable. And that they had died when they were feasting and making merry was another and still more distressing circumstance. Had they died suddenly when they were praying, he might have better borne it, as Job believed in such a state, partying as they were. As they died, they were possibly committing grievous sins, even cursing God. How much more affliction could one man possibly handle? But do remember this, my friends. He believes this is from God. They told him the fire of God came from heaven. So he believes that God has turned on him. They died indeed by a wind of the devil's raising, but which seemed to come from the immediate hand of God and to be sent as a judgment of God upon them for the punishment of their sins. No doubt this was in Job's thoughts. And they were taken away when Job had most need of them to comfort him under all his other losses. And my friends, let you and I take note of this. As a flood of evil pours upon Job, we see the capabilities of Satan once God lowers the divine hedge of his protection. Total destruction in one night. If God doesn't protect us against this most heinous of beings, if we're not protected against him, Look at what he can do. Complete destruction. Then Job arose, verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. And my dear friends, so many were all tested and tried to various degrees. And Paul the Apostle, he was tested so much, but I don't believe anywhere near as badly as Job. But Paul was also tested. And he wrote in 2 Corinthians of not just his testing, but that of the other apostles. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken. God has not forsaken us, cast down, but not destroyed. And for a final note on this first chapter, how devastating, right? But how glorious of an ending that it is. And we find ourselves with Job right there, seemingly in our own minds, I'm certain that all of you parents are thinking about this as well, just wholeheartedly how how much terror that this truly is. But let us know that there is one in heaven in whom is with us every moment. My dear friends, every moment he is with us. He never leaves us. Jesus says, I'm with you always, even until the end of the earth.